Uh, she became the first African-American executive director of Pax Christi USA, so, which is the National Catholic Peace and Justice Movement located here in Washington, D.C. And she's going to speak with us now about her work. And so please give her a round of applause as she comes to the stage today. What up, what up, what up? It is indeed a pleasure for me to stand before you, my young brothers and sisters, because y'all got it going on. Y'all got it going on. I truly believe in what you all have the collective to power to do, that some of us have been scared to do. So what I need to say to you all today is, I'm snatching the covers off. Is that all right with you? We got to snatch the covers off, take the mask off, in order for us to move into the deep. Can somebody say amen around that? And I just need to say a shout out. Omar, your godfather told me to tell you hello. <laughs> so Omar, where you at Omar? Brother Tyrone. All right, all right my brother. <laughs> Rowing into the deep, magi me justice, peace make peace building, and Pax Christi USA anti-racism work. The decision, my brothers and sisters, to go into the deep, as highlighted in the title of this year's Ignatian Solidarity Network, is one that definitely requires preparation beforehand, the ability to live with the grace and treacherousness found in the deep, the knowledge that one is taking a huge risk, the maturity to adapt to the changing tides, the courage to face the ambiguities of the unknown, and the realization that your life and the lives of those on board with you will most likely be transformed, and consequently will never be the same. Y'all got that? If you're going to choose to go into the deep, your life will never be the same. One thing is sure, you do not go into the deep rowing a small, fragile boat propelled by one or two oars, for it is not a seaworthy vessel when confronting the obvious and hidden dimensions of the deep. I'm delighted to have been invited to share with all of you Pax Christi USA's journey into peace building and our work towards dismantling racism. Allow me a moment to verify briefly who and what Pax Christi USA is. For number one, we are a section of Pax Christi International. We are the oldest, largest, nonviolent peace with justice movement in the Catholic Church. We claim that, y'all. Others can duplicate, but we authenticate. If you can't say amen, say ouch. In the US alone, we reach over a half a million Catholics, and we are active on various social media, our website, our blogs. We network with many other 
Catholic coalitions, ecumenical and interfaith groups who are about peace with justice. Pax Christi USA, we have four major priorities that we are about. The spirituality of nonviolence and peacemaking. Disarmament, demilitarization, and reconciliation with justice. Economic and interracial justice in the United States. Human rights and global restoration. Now these initiatives, my brothers and sisters, they have been agreed upon and affirmed by our National Council well over 20 years ago, long before I became the Executive Director of Pax Christi in 2011. Of course, of those years, emphasis was clearly on what I would say three of the four initiatives. And those initiatives took shape in terms of we have programs, we have statements, we have publications, we have prayer study and action guides. One initiative, however, I need to be truthful. One initiative was, so to speak, underdeveloped. And that one is the economic and interracial justice in the US. That's the one that I believe has been given the least amount of attention within Pax Christi USA. However, when the National Council and the search committee offered me the position of executive director, they knew full well, they knew full well <laughs> that interracial justice was near and dear to my heart and that the membership of Pax Christi USA was going to begin to hear more about this particular initiative, as well as raising up the other three. So like I said, they, full, they knew full well that if I was coming on board, that was where my passion was going to be. Somebody say amen. amen. For if ever, there was a journey into the deep, my sisters and brothers. The work of anti-racism is just that. Racism, as I understand from my experience and training, is personal pre racial prejudice plus the misuse of power by systems and institutions. I'm going to say it again in case y'all are sleeping up in here. <laughs> Racism is personal racial prejudice plus the misuse of power by systems and institutions. Y'all got that locked in? Good. The history of the United States, the country I love, we love enough, we need to be critical of this. For the history of racism in the United States is a long, rich, and sick history as it relates to racism. Okay? Long, rich, sick. And, 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 and I, you know, let me not make any, let me not get it twisted up here. I, I, I know that I'm coming to share, and I realize what I got to say. I may never be invited back, but you know something? It's all good. It's all good. I done been run out of a whole lot of places. For, for let me break it on down to y'all a little bit about why I am saying that the history of the United States a long, has a long, rich, and sick history when it comes to racism. The arrogance of European settlers to this country is clearly seen in naming this land the New World. The use and abuse of the native peoples who lived here prior to the European coming. The ragtag group of pilgrims too quickly forgot the freedom of religion, speech, 
an opportunity they sought by coming here, and they doled out the pain and oppression they fled from where they came from, but they, they oppressed the Native American brothers and sisters. The land that the Native people cherished was stolen as their religion and their culture. They were pushed into poverty and into reservations. Their children were stripped of their innocence by abuse, torture, and, quote, re-education. And the treaties that were entered into in good faith with our government, even today, are being disrespected, discarded, and put aside in the name of progress and greed. I told you all I'm keeping it real, keeping it real. The 300 plus years of slavery is a tragic testimony of the disease that has infected this country. Because of the inhumane treatment of our African ancestors, the buying and selling of human beings, the breaking up of families, the searing of children by raping the women who were owned by the master, all of this leaves millions of us, millions of us like myself, unable to identify our ancestry because we were not deemed important enough to be called human. When the settlers needed a system of railroads, bridges, roads, and subways, our government promised citizenship to Asian people if they would come to do the building of our infrastructure, only to exclude them when the work was done, strip them of their naturalized citizenship, no longer allowed to own property, and their assets were seized and given to whites. Japanese Americans fared no better. When forced to live in concentration camps, euphemistically called war relocation camps in 1942, our Mexican brothers and sisters, working as domestics and agricultural workers, were unable to access Social Security. They were forced into dire poverty, had no medical benefits, and soon realized they had no human rights or due process under the law. And today, many of our brothers and sisters still do not. All of these human beings, all of these human beings of African ancestry, African-American ancestry, Caribbean ancestry from Jamaica, Haiti, the islands, Latina, Latinos from Mexico, Latin America, Asians from China, Japan, Korea, Native Americans, Indians, Middle Easterners, all of these can be defined as people who form communities of color, who have endured and continue to live with the oppression that is ingrained in the psyche of the dominant white culture. We know that those who took the words found on the Statue of Liberty seriously and arrived at Ellis Island, those Western Europeans, Italians, Irish, French, German, and the like, they faced their own kind of discrimination because they spoke a different language, ate different foods, and had different names. They suffered. Yes, they suffered. But history rather quickly forgot the differentness between visually they resembled the majority culture. They were white and were not subjected 
to the generations of violence, discrimination, marginalization, and victimization that we see in the communities of color today. If you can't say amen, say ouch. For my young brothers and sisters, history has taught us that all social systems in this country were created to ensure that the power and privilege would remain in the hands of white males, and when white women received the right to vote, they bought into that same privilege. There has never been an equal playing field in the legal system, the political system, the religious systems, the educational systems, the social service systems, the economic systems, and within the family systems. These systems were so structured, my brothers and sisters, so as to be the boot on the backs of communities of color, a boot that strangles them and does not allow them to move up and out of the oppression they experience on a daily basis. In the course of recent years, we have lived with myths and lies that had led us thinking that we were no longer a racist society. The civil rights movement and its offshoots surfaced the ugliness of racism, but that was balanced with the soul-searching quests for liberation and equality. During that time, there was a sense of maybe now was the time to experience the downfall of segregation and the Jim Crow laws. My brothers and sisters, that did not happen. We were also fed the myth that the ideal was to be colorblind when it came to accepting diversity. We are all one was preached from pulpits and platforms while our actions failed to match the rhetoric that was trying to convince us that we were living in a post-racial world. And perhaps the biggest myth of all was that once we elected an African-American president, that we had made it, that we had crossed over, that there was no more racism in the United States. Our proof was in the White House. People of color, we knew all along that all of this was an illusion, a myth, a lie, that white people needed to believe so they could feel better. I got to keep it real. <laughs> what had changed is that the ugliness of racism was just under the surface and subtle. In 2013, Congress passed the Voter Rights Act in an attempt to make sure that President Obama would not be elected to a second term. Don't get it twisted. This act was aimed at minority voters, and what it did was it intended to discourage voting because what did it do? It required a photo ID to vote. It slashed early voting, online, and same-day registration. And then what we did was we moved into this thing called redistricting, okay, where we began to divide communities into voting districts and then not allowing out-of-district voting or we packed minority citizens in a few districts as possible, making the lines longer, the opportunity to vote more difficult, and saying that the polls would have to close. This act became law, but it did not achieve its intended result. For uh, brother, President Obama was reelected and stayed in the White House for another four years. Another example of systemic racism 
is the mass incarceration of black, brown men, women, and juveniles on drug charges that their white counterparts have money to pay lawyers for and to get them off. And lastly, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the opioid addiction among black and Latino populations has been dramatically increasing for the last three years with little to no outcry. Now that this addiction has hit the folks in the white suburbs, it is being called an epidemic. And only now are billions of federal and state dollars going into treatment and rehab. None of this is coincidence. It is systemic racism being played out on a grand scale. And you and I and me, we must see it for what it is. Which brings us into the now. In the midst of an embarrassing two years of campaigning for the presidency of this country, where bullying, derogatory remarks, sarcasm, lies, bigotry, and racism raised its ugly head, Pox Christie USA went into the deep. In the days since the shock of November 8th, 2017, where revenge, backbiting, shaming, and fabrications of reality are the norm, Pox Christie USA chooses to stay on the journey. For racism is no longer under the surface. It is no longer dormant. It is blatant all around us. It is the face of white nationalism. Our work has brought us into parishes, colleges, high school, interfaith groups, ecumenical coalitions, organizations, and communities of women religious. Pax Christi, we have done one-day workshop, parish retreats, weekend-long seminars, eight-day retreats. For going into the deep of racism at times is not all welcoming nor appreciated. During our trainings, we present a wall of history with marker points of history of racism and the history of re resistance. Few quibble with the historical evidence. However, things get tense when we ask the question, how have I or we been complacent with America's original sin, as Jim Wallace so aptly calls racism? In answering the question, there is no way around confronting the racial oppression that those of us who are people of color have internalized because we, as people of a color, we have internalized some of this, uh, uh, of this uh, racism and oppression. Neither is there a way around confronting the racial superiority that those of you who are white have internalized. Y'all with me? All right, okay. In plumbing the depth of these two questions, we have to leave our comfort zones we have to look at our shadow sides. We have to move away from what is safe to what is redemptive. However, we enjoy being ignorant. For being ignorant, it is safe. Claims of not knowing, aid and abate, abusive systems of power that rely on complacency to keep going. Claiming ignorance comes from a position of naivety, but from a position of power and the desire to maintain that power. I'm comfortable and I'm staying where it is safe. Feeds the fragility of whiteness. For white supremacy is a belief system and a power system that sustains white privilege and maintains racial oppression. Look at what happened in Charlottesville and elsewhere. The journey into the deep that Pax Christi USA invites people to is to right relationships and to the formation of the beloved community. It is an invitation and a plea to make connections 
with what is happening now in this country. There is but one common thread woven around the immigrant and refugee communities, the DACA and the DREAMers, the same thread that weaves through the environmental degradation of our people and with the slow and sometimes not consistent relief efforts of the recent hurricanes where the toxic wastes are dumped and where water and still, and still is infested with lead. The same thread connects those men and women affected by Middle Eastern travel bans, our Muslim brothers and sisters. The thread around those most likely to be subject to police brutality and violence is the same one that is wrapped around those incarcerated and on death row. And the same thread is around those women and children caught in the nightmare of human trafficking. <laughs> do, do we even see the thread? Do we want to see it? Can we make the connections? The human beings who are trafficked, banned from every entry to this country, barely surviving in our prisons, living on nuclear dump sites, immigrants and refugees, those daily threatened with deportation are all people from communities of color. We don't want to see that fact. We think they are isolated incidents, coincidence, but my sisters and brothers, they are connected. We would rather argue minimize, distort, and explain away the realities that white supremacy produces. We have to stop finding excuses to explain away the suffering and pain of racism. Make the connections. See the intersectionality. See the raw use of misuse of power. Our failure to make the connection means that we continue to the complicity, hate, and violence that racism breeds. This is the pushback that Pox Christie USA faces on a daily basis because of our commitment to dismantling racism within our organization and beyond. My brothers and sisters, we cannot heal what we cannot own. And we all need healing. All of us up in here need healing. We cannot be in right relationship with each other if we cannot be open and transparent. We cannot form the beloved community if we are frightened by conflict. The work of Pax Christi USA is based on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, whose words were neither neutral nor detached. Lift the broken and forgotten. Feed the hungers of the human heart. Be gentle with those who grieve. Liberate those unjustly bound. Let your heart be broken by suffering, your own and that of others. Our Catholic social teachings put our work into perspective and into a larger context. For our Catholic social teaching says we exclude no one from your circle of solidarity and equality. Believe in the human dignity of all life, even the most offensive, undeserving, and unpleasant. Embrace the common good and have a heart for everyone. Use your participation and belonging to associations as a way of reminding others of those who are not at the table. Know that the preferential option for the poor includes you also. And realize that the stewardship is based on what is just and not what is fair. There's a difference between what is just and what is fair. Those of us in this room who are white are so steeped in it that you don't know how to begin being allies because you know a handful of people of color 
and you like to hang with them, and because you can speak another language, that does not make you an ally. Because you like our food, because you like our dance, because you like the way we wear our hair, because you like our swag, does not make you an ally. Come on, y'all. An ally, my sisters and brothers, does not make excuses for stepping into and taking from his or her white privilege and being hurtful. The words, I'm sorry, are spoken much more frequently than, I didn't mean that. An ally does not have to have something to say all of the time about everything. We do not have to prove how liberal and anti-racist we are on a social media or elsewhere. We need to listen more. And an ally needs to be about his or her own education on racist systems and institutions in this country. Asking people of color to do your white homework and to point out to those of you who are white what racism is, is irresponsible and quite honestly lazy. I could go on and on with the do's and don'ts of being an ally, but we people of color, here we go, we also have homework to do. In order to heal from our internalized racial oppression, we need, as people of color, to stop pitting communities of color against each other. We too often scapegoat. We too often scapegoat the Latina, Latina community with the Mexican one, the Puerto Rican community with the Islanders, the African-born community with the African-Americans, we need to realize that the suffering and pain is suffering and pain, and that we are all in this struggle together for liberation together. In order to heal, we need to share our stories with each other and with our white brothers and sisters. But to share our stories, we need a safe place to be vulnerable and honest. We need people to really listen to us and respect our experiences with silence and deep empathy. Something happens when both speaking and listening is reverenced. It is a sacred moment. It's a transformational moment. It is not merely a kumbaya moment or a peek into a pain of another. It is the beginning of being in right relationships with each other. In order for people of color to heal, we have to find respite from the exhaustion, weariness, and violence of living as marginalized people in this world. We need people who look like us to nourish us, to affirm us, to support us, so we can go back into the trenches and work for liberation. No offense, but there are days when I cannot spend another moment with white folk. You as young adults, being tremendously gifts to the movement to bring about peace with justice. You are open to working through what it means to be an ally. You have an energy and a passion for justice. You have the ability to speak up and show up. And in addition to asking lots of questions, you also have the ability to do critical social analysis to look at things with a critical eye and feel deeply when justice is denied. Journeying into the deep is the work of a lifetime. It is neither a fad nor a whim. It is not for the faint-hearted, nor the whiner, nor the one looking for instant gratification and immediate results. I read recently that I lose my moral right to speak on peace if I have not previously spoken on injustice. I lose my moral right to speak on peace if I have not previously spoken on injustice. This is our moment in history. My brothers and sisters, my young brothers and sisters, and we must shout from the housetops the injustices that we see all around us. For unless we do, 
we have no right to speak of, much less the desire, the peace we so deeply crave. Racism in the U.S. is our greatest injustice. It has crippled all of us in the human community. It is our national disease and in our collective DNA. While getting sick was not our fault, getting well and healing together is our responsibility. <laughs> Dismantling racism is something we must do together. Peace building is something we must do together. We build two-way bridges to form the beloved community, not walls. We support and affirm one another, not dictate. We lay claim to our innate goodness, ours and that of the other. So in closing, I want you all to do a couple of things. One, I want you all, when you get back home, to check on your campus to see if you have a Pox Christie USA chapter. If you don't, you need to get on it. And then in closing, I wish us all the moral courage to speak up. I wish us all the passion to show up. I wish us all the empathy to keep up. And I wish us all the humility to look up. For as leaders of justice, like the stars, you will shine forever. Peace, and I'm out. Everyone, give it up.